Hey guys, it's Derek with Mobile CNC. Let me give you a little intro on Autodesk Fusion 360. This is the software that we recommend for most new users. There's a learning curve to it, but it's well worth sticking around and learning. All right, what we're going to do today is model a 100 by 100 millimeter square. We're going to turn it into a 3D model or 3D body. And then I'm going to show you how to machine it using the cam settings. We're going to go pretty quick, so feel free to pause so you can match what I'm doing in your version of Autodesk Fusion 360. All right, so here I am in my model workspace. We're going to be working in the model workspace, and then later on we'll be in the cam workspace. You'll switch between the two by just clicking on this drop-down menu here. Again, starting in the model workspace. I want to create a rectangle. So what I'm going to do is come down here to sketch, rectangle, and two-point rectangle. Here I'm going to be able to select the plane that I'd like to use, and I want to use this plane here. All right, now I'm going to select that bottom left. Now that's going to be the origin. It's going to be the bottom left of my rectangle. And I'm going to type 100, click tab, 100, and press my tab button. And you see I've got padlocks next to those dimensions, and that means that I've locked in that dimension for that particular feature. I'll press enter, and now I've got a 100 by 100 millimeter square in my workspace. I'm going to stop the sketch, and I want to extrude it up into a 3D body. Now, what that means is you're actually going to add some dimension to it. You're going to take this face here, and you're going to pull it out to make it three-dimensional to do that because it's just easier to generate my cam settings from a 3D body. All right, so I'll click on the actual face that I want to extrude with my left mouse button. Then I'm going to right-click that. I'll click Extrude. Now, in this particular case, I have a 13-millimeter piece of MDF that I will be cutting, so I'm going to extrude this into a 13-millimeter uh, square. So 13 millimeters, I'm going to make a new body and I'm going to click OK. When I do that, I get a new body that pops up here over in my toolbar. All right, I can change my perspective here by clicking in this cube and you see that we've got a three-dimensional body. All right, so this is just how I want it. I'm going to slide on over to the cam workspace by clicking here. In cam, the first thing I need to do is set up my cam operations. Now the setup is going to kind of let your machine know, or let Autodesk Fusion 360 know rather, uh, just what you want to call as the origin for this part, etc. I'm going to click set up. By default, it placed it in the center of my model. I'm okay with that. So I'll click stock. And I don't want to add any additional stock, so I'll click this and no additional stock. There are some reasons you want to sometimes. In this case, I don't. No additional stock. I'll go back over to setup. I could move my part origin to all kind of different places. I'm not going to. Leave it here in the center as a general rule. You want the top of the, or excuse me, you want the origin to be at the top of your stock. Might be some reasons you don't want to in the future as you learn more. Right now, leave it at the top. I'll click OK. I'm only going to do one operation on this particular part. It's going to be a 2D contour operation. What a 2D contour operation is, is it just fall particular contour. And what a contour is, as an example, is you see this bolded, this bolded portion here. I'm hovering over it and it says contour selection. That's the contour that I'm going to choose to machine here. I'm going to click that and it automatically brings me over to my geometry tab and recognizes that I click that as the contour that I want to select for machining. All right. You could have actually clicked over here, clicked contour selection and done that, but Fusion 360 is smart enough to know that's what you meant. I'm going to click back over to tool. Now, there's a lot here to know about. You can go over to samples and uh, select the operation that you're doing. Um, let's just say it's a contour operation. Okay. It's going to give you the option for some end mills. Uh, 
take note that the stock uh, tools that are in here, the sample tools that they've already set up for you in Fusion 360, are not necessarily going to match the tool that you're putting in your hand. You'll learn later on that you need to actually measure the features on your tool to make sure if you're specifying a quarter inch tool that it actually is a quarter inch tool or your cut is not going to come out and match what you modeled. Uh, right now, I'm going to cheat a little bit and use a tool that I've already set up. I set up a quarter inch end mill that's two flute. The flute count matters when it comes to calculating your chip load automatically. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Right now, just know that I'm using a quarter inch two flute end mill that I'd already set up. If you choose to set up one, you can click on the tool library here. Watch another video on YouTube about how to do that. So by default on the tool I set up, it brought in some cut settings that were appropriate for the material I set that particular tool up for. I'm going to modify these a little bit. I'm going to turn my coolant off because I don't actually have any coolant running on this machine. It doesn't matter if you leave it on. It's not going to hurt anything on the machine that is not equipped with a coolant setup. My spindle speed uh, is not actually going to matter on one of the Millwright CNC machines that has manual RPM control. Uh, there are some guys that will uh, have enough experience to set up a G-code controlled RPM on their spindles and routers, but uh, you guys probably aren't watching this video. So just know that it matters for the purpose of calculating the speed per tooth which also will depend on the float count of the tool that you selected. Just take my word for it right now that you need to have a two flute quarter inch end mill and you need to give it a 2200 millimeter per minute feed rate. Um, we'll leave it at 26,000. That's going to be the WD, WDP611 router that we sell on almost wide open setting. So 2200 millimeters per minute will lead in at 2000, lead it out at 2000, and that's just how it comes into the part and tries to keep from leaving uh, artifacts of the tool as it entered the contour that it's machining. You'll learn more about that later. I'll ramp at 300, excuse me, I'm going to ramp at 2000, and I'm going to plunge at 300. Not 3000, I'm going to plunge at 300. All right, my geometry is okay. I want to put some tabs on this thing. When I click tabs, I'm going to accept the tabs it's going to put by default. What the tabs will do is it's going to hop up the tool when it gets to this tab to make sure that it doesn't break free from the stock and go flying somewhere when I'm machining it. So I get towards that bottom contour. The clearance height is okay. Leave it how... Fusion 360 has it by default until you get a little more experience to understand the implications of changing these settings. The passes is going to be very important, the passing tabs. You want to click multiple depths. Fusion 360 is going to assume by default that you want to machine the entire thickness at one time. Almost any machine with a 13 millimeter thick stock, you are not going to want to do that. That includes ours. We're going to have a pretty conservative setting at three millimeters. All right. You also, as a general rule, want to click to use even step downs. There's some reasons you don't, but as you learn more, you'll find out why. Click on use even step downs. And roughing passes is something you'll learn about later that will help uh, give you some chip clearance as you're machining harder materials very deep. And can also... Uh, allow you to do a finishing pass, which is going to uh, help leave a cleaner finish on the finished product. Uh, for now, we're going to leave that alone, unchecked. We'll go to our linking tab. By default, it's going to do a lead in and lead out move, which will allow. Ramping has un is unchecked by default, but we're going to click a ramp. And what that's going to allow it to do is uh, literally ramp into the stock versus making a straight downward plunge in it. An end mill is not designed to do a straight downward plunge. There are some ways that you can do that and kind of get away from it, get away with it. Uh, but as a general rule, use a ramp as you enter your material. 
These settings you can learn more about later and manipulate. We'll just leave it as the default. I'm going to click OK, and it's going to generate my toolpath over here. It thought about it very briefly, generated by toolpath. You see here are some things. It's leading into the cut, which are our lead in and lead out moves. It's got multiple lines here uh, because it's going downward uh, in each successive pass to get towards the bottom contour. This red line is the ramp that it's making as it moves from each depth. And you see here where it's hopping it up, that's the tab that it's leaving. And I'm pretty happy with that toolpath. I can right click and I can tell it to simulate if I so chose. And it's going to think about that for a moment and then you can simulate the toolpath. You can fast forward, you can learn more about your simulation controls in another video. Good idea to simulate your toolpath to make sure it does what you actually want it to do. I'm going to close that now, and what I want to do is post process this. Now, what post process means is take this toolpath that I've created and put it into G code that my machine can understand. Uh, you may not have this option on your toolbar, so I'm going to click Options, Post Process. All right, here you're going to select the generic. Gerbil or Gerbil.cps from your post processors. If you don't do this, if you've got like um, uh, some other post processor selected, like a Multicam post, it may run crazy on your machine. There are uh, a lot of different tweaks in each controller. G code is a loose standard. So make sure you've got Gerbil.cps selected if you're running our M3 or Carve King. You can give it a program name that you like, uh, test file. Some things that I like to do here, I like to turn G28 off. Uh, you can learn a little more about what G28 does. Uh, it has some uses. In this case, I want to turn it off. Okay, I'm going to click Post. Now, when I do that, I've got Open NC and Editor selected. So when I do that, it's going to bring up and I'm just going to click Save here. You want to put it somewhere on your desktop that you can find it. But I'm going to click Save here so it's going to pull up um, the editor that is called Brackets. It's probably going to ask to install if it's the first time you've used it. And this is going to allow me to see my G code and make some edits to it. I like to edit this line out. G54 is a coordinate selection command. There are some reasons I personally do not like them to be in my G code. Um, I'm not going to explain why right now to save us all some time. I like to delete that and let's just replace it with a G0Z10. And that's just going to tell it to make sure that the tool is 10 millimeters above the stock. Hopefully you've zeroed your machine out to the top of the stock. So as it comes down, these commands and settings here that it is listing, it's going to make sure it lifts it up 10 millimeters above the stock, if not already, before it makes a traverse in the XY plane, which is what this command does. So when I'm ready to run, I can hit, or when I've made that change, I can click Save. That save will be recorded into the file in the folder that I specified uh, earlier in Fusion 360. So that's a wrap on running a basic file out of Fusion 360. From here, I would select my G code sender and I would open this file into my G code sender and I could send it to my machine. We'll have another video that explains that. Thanks.